this session kind of selfishly is an issue that is really close to my heart because um, I guess when you're outside of the food world, you kind of think, oh, it's, it's a bit weird that you have a, like, such dominance from certain cuisines. And then, you know, growing up as I did, kind of as a person with um, one parent from Jamaica, one parent from Malta, and you're like, but, you know, there's so many amazing cuisines out there that I don't really get a look in. And also the way that language works around food and, you know, the whole kind of different systems about what foods are celebrated and what nations are celebrated and others are neglected. And, um, and so I'm really happy that we get to have this discussion in the British Library. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a really special, important thing. Um, so our chair, I'm going to introduce our amazing chair, Mela Cardle. And um, she is a food writer, I guess unofficially a food historian. She is an incredible storyteller. And she is the per per perfect person, beg your pardon, to lead this discussion because she has such an amazing 360 view on, on so many things. And, um, and I know that she is a firm believer in when you cut up vegetables finely, you are cutting them into matchsticks, you're not juliening them, which I think is kind of quite an important thing for, for us to sort of think about today. Um, joining her, our incredible uh, panel, we have um, uh, Maria Bradford, um, Danae Moore, and Aji Okokomi. Um, Melek is going to introduce them, so please just a massive round of applause for our incredible panel and chair. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the talk and then all the panellists. Um, so, so much of our food wisdom and culture celebrated um, by the global majority today, including plant-based eating, sustainability and nose-to-tail cookery have been practiced on the African continent for generations. Yet for too long, the narrative around food excellence has been dominated by French and European cuisines. Our foods have been otherized, exoticized, hijacked, reduced, because the narrative is often framed and constructed from the context of the Western and European gaze. Um, so meaning we are the opposite of something rather than rooted in the context of our own histories and values. The true beating heart of London has always had thriving African, Caribbean, Asian food communities that have served themselves. Um, but there is now a reclaiming of how it's consumed, represented and perceived by the others. So with this said, it is great pleasure that I want to introduce our panellists. Firstly, we have acclaimed chef and author whose food flavours um, and flavours reflect both, of, both her Jamaican upbringing as well as her musical background in, a way, in the way it moves so cogently across flavours and textures, bold, bountiful and curious. So it's so perfect that her stunning cookbook is called Plentiful. Please, can we welcome <laughs> Danae Moore? <laughs> Uh, so, we have also the founder and owner of the groundbreaking restaurant Okoko. We've got Aji Okokomi here, name, um, named one of London's top 100 restaurants in its first year. Okoko riffs on dishes from Nigeria, Senegal and Ghana, paying homage to dishes he grew up on and um, mixing those traditional dishes with innovative dishes too. Okoko has had an epic journey to even exist and I can't wait to welcome him. Um, and let's welcome him <laughs> to tell us more about it. Okay. Finally, uh, we have an award-winning chef, writer, and founder of Schwen Schwen Catering Company, Maria Bradford, born and raised in Sierra Leone, uh, Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown. Maria's debut book, Sweets Alone, will be out soon. Um, I have been lucky enough to already uh, get my hands on an early copy. And not only is it the first Sierra Leonean cookbook to be published by a mainstream publisher in the UK, it's simply engrossing and is an ode to her home. So let's welcome Maria. <laughs> right, let's get started. Um, I, I really want to start off by talking about um, your journeys into food and whether it felt like a conscious decision 
or if it was instinctive and natural. Um, so I, I feel, for me, for example, my personal relationship with cooking and food um, has always felt like, an, like just a form of expression. And it's, I think, a superior language to one of words. Um, I think it's a, a superior way of uh, preserving history, a superior way of connecting with people. So I think it's always existed as, as that for me and naturally became something I do. Um, would you f do you feel like it's the same for you or do you remember a moment you made the decision? Danae, I'd love to start with you because um, you, had this, you have this uh, amazing career in music and, mm -hmm. and you draw parallels and distinctions mm -hmm. between that, you know, and music is a form of expression as well. So for you, was this an instinctive thing and, you know, does it feel natural to do it and when did that happen? Yeah, I think it definitely felt really natural. And I think just like anything, I was obsessed with food. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I was obsessed with how it brought people together. I was like so excited for Christmas, so excited for Easter, so excited to try all these different foods that I like have these deep cravings for. And so I was just obsessed with being a host. I'm like mm. one of those people that I want to please everyone. I want to like make something, not only because I'm excited to make it, because I love the idea of bringing people together with food. So before I started Dee's Table, I was doing these like elaborate dinners. Like I'd make five dishes <laughs> and I'd like make an ice cream and I'd do all these like ridiculous things um, that made me so excited and I'd invite people over. And then everyone was like, why don't you do something? And I didn't know how, so it took me quite a while to like figure out how to approach it. Because I guess you think you have to go to culinary school, you have to do all this, like, these different things, you have to have these qualifications, you have to feel like, yeah, I'm mm. a proper chef. Now I can enter the world, with, you know, and actually kind of do it, mm. instead of, like, earned it, right? And so I just did it in the end, and I mm. threw myself in the deep end, and I did a supper club um, for, like, 40 people, and the rest was history, I guess, and... Yeah. Mm. And um, actually, you speak about culinary school um, and, you know, some people feeling like they need to. Um, Aji, Maria, you, you both went to a culinary school and you went to Leeds. You went both to went Leeds. to Leeds, yes. didn't you? Yes. Um, yeah. And what, like, what, what made you make that decision? I wanted to ask you both. Yeah. Um, were you in food before? Did you feel like you needed to, to occupy the space of food? And, you know, what do you think about the idea of a European classical um, education in food and like what did that teach you about um, your own like mm. traditions and wisdoms in food? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, that's, that yeah. <laughs> Should I go fast? You know, yes. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I think I, uh, when I got into food, uh, for whatever reason, anything I want to do, I just want to read about it firstly. You know, I'm a little academic like that. So I just wanted to read about food. I knew it was going to be West African food, so I didn't find not much to read about other than speak to aunties and people. But I just also wanted to learn about great cooking, good cooking, what does that look like? And so the next thing was to go to school, and I discovered that Leeds was one of the best. I was working at the time, but I wanted to be able to just work at the same time and study as well. So there was this wonderful course, it was a 10, 10 weeks, which was very useful. <laughs> And you know what I learned there was actually how you know um, you know French cuisine has been documented, you know, studied over time. It's been put together, you know, lots of materials on it, and you know how people actually you know uh, create, you know, cook the food and all of that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And whilst I was there, I was learning that I was keen, I was interested, I enjoyed it. But also, I was also thinking of imagine we had you know uh, African cooking all put together, agreed, documented. And that's what I was actually thinking. So when I knew I was going to create a restaurant, I said, yes, what I'm going to do, get all of those things from the aunties, from moms and all of that, and put it together in a book and practice it. I pretty much write a book and then turn that book into a restaurant. And that's pretty much what we've done uh, with our cocoa. Maria, what about yourself? For me, it was very different. Um, I was in food already, um, just doing it for myself, basically, just to make myself happy. Um, and doing supper clubs, I, had, I was doing supper clubs, so I had products line, I had about eight products line, 
but I didn't, it was more confidence in my own ability. Mm -hmm. And um, and I also I was doing Afrofusion. I wanted to know the ifs and the hows, and um, if things go wrong, how do you correct it? If I'm making mayonnaise and it goes wrong, I want to know why it's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. um, if I mix oil and um, eggs together, when it turns into emulsion, why did it do that? And um, so it, those fundamentals, but for me, Leeds wasn't really about it was more confidence because I felt like what I was doing, I don't need to go to Leeds to learn how to cook Sierra Leonean food. Mm. I've learned that already, but I needed to know the ifs and the hows of the Afrofusion and blending ingredients together. And so that's why I went there. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Um, actually, that, that I want to ask um, you, Aji, about then opening your restaurant and yeah. the journey that was and occupying these new spaces. So Leeds being... Um, a new space yeah. for you guys, but also then occupying, so you you opening a restaurant in uh, central London, so there are many African restaurants in uh, many different parts of London, but in central London, it's yeah. it's very rare. Yeah. And um, I'd love to for you to tell us about that journey and how, what were the struggles with that? Uh, it is, after lit, I uh, enjoyed it, I thought, yeah, Going to open a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, I knew I was going to be part of, a, you know, a founder. You know, going to be part of, you know, the, the food as well. Pretty much to provide uh, the information, all of the recipes that I've put together, and that I've also practiced. So um, I started working in my kitchen. Pretty much turned our kitchen into a test kitchen. So had all of the ice cream making machines, so, you know, all the tools really that you would really use in a pro professional kitchen. And I started to work with chefs, you know, that felt so serious and, you know, uh, had the same passion about food. But this is going to be West African food. How then can we bring this to the city? I wanted something that was quality. I wanted, I wanted something that was going to be uh, a, a restaurant, you know, that was going to uh, showcase West African cooking at a very high level. That was the aim then, that was the vision. And that's still the vision, really. So I just wanted to work with you know, wonderful chefs that knew what they were doing, and then create you know, all these recipes, and then pretty much show the world. And so whilst we're doing that in the test kitchen, I was also speaking to um, investors, uh, speaking to landlords, and seeing how we could actually get a space in central London. Uh, did my homework. Uh, did the uh, feasibility studies and all of that. And then we found that, okay, Londoners really, uh, people living in the UK are not keen to learn about other people's cultures, all the food, you know, it's so cosmopolitan. And I think it's such a wonderful city to then, you know, bring, you know, something uh, like a cocoa. And then we were so sure of that, it now got into the funding. We went to the banks, it was like, no, We've not heard this before, you know, how is this going to work? You know, it's, it's a nice idea, but then to throw money at it, and, you know, it's not a few thousand, it's quite a lot of money uh, to, to open a restaurant in central London. Went to, to, to wonderful investors, pretty much all of them, that would typically invest in concepts they thought was interesting. I said, oh, he's quite keen, he's wonderful, but... I'm not sure, I don't think, you know. Go, you know, there was one that was really keen and you know, had a meeting with me, spoke with me, like, it's quite interesting, I can see this doing well, but uh, I'm not sure, but maybe when you make it successful, I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll then see, you know, you, know, you know, maybe that's gonna be a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, yeah, I'm gonna make it successful. And then it's gonna be a thing that people will want to get into and actually see the future in it. And then somehow, you know, through family, you know, personal funding, all of that, we got the money. I thought, okay, well, we have the money now, the space. And, you know, with no express thinking, it's just to get a nice location and then, you know, and then that was actually the hardest part. So getting the fun, getting funding, you know, having your own money doesn't mean you'll be able to get, you know, suitable places in central London. It's actually... Who are you? Who do you know? Have you got experience? Have you got other restaurants? You know, who's your chef and so on and so forth? How much have you got? You know, is it going to be the right concept for our space, our streets and all of mm. that stuff? And then that was pretty, really difficult. Mm. And I kept knocking on doors. And, and what's actually quite key, key is actually being able to keep pushing forward until I then found someone who was a 
you know, Italian restaurant or already had about 40 restaurants, was looking to retire, sell off his restaurants, and then say, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna speak to a landlord on your behalf. And that's pretty much how we got the space. Wow. Yeah. So it was an Italian chef who <laughs> yeah. spoke to Italian a Italian restaurant who had loads of restaurants re uh, wow. retiring. Wow. Yeah. That reminds me a lot of when um, I opened my cafe back in uh, 2012 in, uh, in Hackney. Uh, and it was a time when the area was changing a lot, like fast paced gentrification was happening. And I'd grown up there. And I was really, like, m me and my partners were really keen to open a space that was still part of the community um, mm -hmm. and um, reflected the community that had lived there for so long um, and the wealth um, of the community there, the cultures, the, the, like, the, the textures, the colours, the flavours, um, but was also, like, exciting with the new stuff happening. And I, uh, so it was like this new build area, this, uh, the square, and we had to put in a proposal. We got the, I mean, it got rejected and we had to put in another proposal of what it was gonna be. But once we got the space, we had to apply for a license for evening restaurant wine. Yeah. And we got more rejections mm -hmm. than anyone had in the borough, in the history of the borough. <laughs> they, 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 they had no yeah. qualms in telling us. But yeah. part of like get, um, getting rejections, you can appeal. So they send you all the rejections and like everyone's, what everyone wrote. And it was the most like crazy thing to read what people wrote. And yeah. one of them, one of the people who just moved into the area um, had said uh, something like, we've brought our taxes here and uh, like tax, we're tax paying money and we'll leave if you open another kebab shop here. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's the presumption that I was going to open another, like I, <laughs> from my background, yeah. a Middle Eastern place. Yeah. It's going to be another kebab shop. We don't need another kebab shop in the area, which I was horrified. And we had to go to the, like the town hall to represent ourselves. And I felt like it was like this Tom Cruise moment where I was like, no, <laughs> this is what we are. And, and, and but those, I remember specifically that man who wrote that, yeah never forget his name because he was a resident in the building and we were actually a resident in the building too and he was an old head teacher retired head teacher and for six months we built that place from the ground up ourselves like everything and um he kept walking past giving like looks like oh, what is this place gonna be <laughs> six months of watching us we broke him, he finally came in. <laughs> he finally came in and he, we sat him down, we fed him for free yeah. and he, 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 he cried, he, oh, he apologised. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but anyway, so that, I want to talk yeah. about, um, so, you know, we've talked a little uh, bit about your journeys yeah. and different, uh, you know, challenges. I want to talk about, like, representation and authenticity yeah. in the food yeah. and that being an internal challenge, right, yeah. um, of... How do you find the balance of being authentic to yourself and authentic to the food that you're representing from a region mm. where, where, where you're from and how you found that balance in, what, uh, in your cookbooks and um, the food you cook? Um, um, for me, I feel like it's quite easy because even in the cookbook, it's very, very clear what's traditional and what's Afrofusion because I feel like the traditional stuff for me I don't want to water it down for anybody. Mm. I want it to represent Sierra Leone. I want when somebody eats it, they feel like they're eating in a Sierra Leonean home. So I stay true to those. And then the Afrofusion part for me, it's um, using traditional ingredients that we all know and make something new with mm. it. And that way I'm able to do justice to my heritage and my culture, but then I'm also experimenting with new ingredients. So I'm not selling myself short in any way. Mm -hmm. um, possible, so that's how I balance it. Mm. Yeah, um, and um, what what about you, Danae? Because you you kind of um, embrace the idea of fusion, right, with your cooking? Yeah, I guess if in a similar way, mm. I kind of take the flavors that I grew up mm. with in Jamaica, and I have a very fond like memory of my childhood home and the things that I ate. And for instance, I had this massive like tamarind tree in my garden and I remembered picking tamarind and my mum would make tamarind juice and these are the things that are like instilled in me and I feel like everyone has those memories mm. of the food that they had in their home and you know in Jamaica obviously you know I will always say my mum's rice and peas and my mum's fried dumplings are the best because 
I mean, I feel like I'd get in trouble if I didn't say that. <laughs> but also, I feel like everyone's family has their own version. Like, there's, like, the slight tweak. Like, someone might put garlic in their rice. Maybe some might put more of this. Or, like, they might be a bit more heavy-handed on the polenta. Or, like, there's certain things that I think is, like, your own personal DNA. So mm. when I've written this, you know, writing this book, it's really important to me to tap into that and the things that are most important to me and what makes me me. And mm. so there are those mm. things, like mm. there's a porridge recipe dedicated to my nana because she'd always make me hominy corn porridge when I went to Sheffield. So it felt right to put that in, but then there's also the part of my brain that's like curious and I'm mm. like, you know, what excites me the most? What do I want to make? So I have stuff like rice and peas arancini, which is like I did at, I had this like residency in um, Deptford and I had it for like three months. And that was so fun because I guess, yeah, for me, I'd wake up every day before I started this table. And I'd like, if I had a free day, I would just cook and I would just, you know, go through the ideas in my notepad and be like, okay, this could be fun. Why don't I make this version of like, make it into like an ice cream sandwich. And to me, it's like a continuous like journey almost of like exploring myself mm -hmm. and how I see food. <laughs> And so I want to honor the memories, but I want to make, it's like the newness. I want to do something mm. new and what makes me the most excited, but also what pushes me. I think that's how you like push yourself um, as a chef or just, or just in anything that you do. It's like, you should, you should respond to that curious part of your brain. I think Absolutely. that's something that most people don't do or they feel like afraid. And it's mm. like, there's so many rules and the rules are there, they're important. I also think like you should like listen to that thing because mm. it could be amazing. Yeah. Mm. Like it just, it could really yeah. work and you're like, okay, yeah. that's pretty good, mm. right? It's really tricky and yes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to balance authenticity uh, and creativity. I think it's, 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 uh, uh, it's quite important. And I think what we do uh, in the kitchen we have, uh, our wonderful chefs are here too, and we're happy that they're here to listen to this. It's, we have what we call the Akoko core, pretty much, you know, the core, you know, mother sauces, like you'd have in, you know, French cuisine. We have the atta, so that's the base. So we have, you know, things that are traditional that we make, and it's actually fun uh, to show the chefs as well. And I think when I opened Akoko, what I wanted to do was to get people from various backgrounds to get involved in the cooking and also in the eating of the food, pretty much sharing myself, my culture, what I've learned from grandmas, what I've put together from various parts of you know, West Africa. And I think what we could then build upon. In a couple of dishes, I would like to make it, uh, if we're gonna call something, say, abunubunu, uh, which is a Ghanaian stew, I wanted to have all the ingredients that a you know, Ghanaian woman would use and also the methods we could just blend it, you know, make it into uh, a, 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 a very creamy puree and then serve it with a wonderful, beautiful, you know, Lake District, uh, Lake District fish or, or meat and all of that stuff. And I think that's what I wanted, you know, so we, we're being creative, but then paying homage to all those recipes, not changing it quite a lot, not adding what is, would be deemed a little bit unnecessary. Mm. And, you know, there are parts where we want to be so creative uh, it's in the snacks, it's in the desserts, mm. but then it's trying to use, you know, um, African ingredients of a particular technique and then see what is going to come up, what we're going to come up with. But then still being proud and still calling it, you know, it's West African, it's inspired, we want people to come and experience something new. And that new is pretty much West Africa, that, you know, a clever balance between authenticity and our innovation and creativity. Mm. Yeah. And that leads me on to like what, what, what people's reception of yeah. your food um, and reactions, so mm. both from familiar and unfamiliar palates. Yeah. So you, you mentioned, Aji, when we were sp speaking the other day about in your own kitchen yeah. from your team, yeah. um, when, you're, when you're making stock, yeah. You're making it slightly differently yeah. to the traditional method and how people yeah. have reacted to that within the kitchen or, um, yeah, customers who are familiar with the food or the region or who are from the region, how they react um, as opposed to... So we're chefs that are not uh, a West African in that kitchen. They go, you're making stuff. How come there isn't celery there? No <laughs> wine or no carrots. You don't have to use that. And no... 
and again, because we've been through, uh, you know, various types of, you know, um, uh, kitchen really, pretty much in a cooker restaurant. Um, and I think, you know, it's so funny how, you know, people just think it must be wrong, because that's not how you make a stock. No, it's not wrong, it's how you make it. Yeah. And it's actually more delicious. And I think when I was in Leeds, I really wanted to learn about the stock making day. Mm -hmm. It was a Saturday, it was an entire day uh, where we cooked it for about six hours yeah. and all of that. And then we're making it, we went for break, came back, and we're still doing for an entire day. And we tasted it, it was like, okay, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> As if it was, hmm. But I can imagine those African moms just, you know, uh, fish, and they were, you know, beautiful. It's, and it's called Omiero in, you know, um, Yoruba. Mm -hmm. So we make so that's, that's actually Omiero. It's quite quicker, mm. and it's more potent. It's delicious, you know. You know, I think the aunties and the mothers will go, okay, the meat, the fish, the, all of that, you're cooking it in its own juice, and the juice is coming out, and all the onions in it, just a little bit of water here and there, and, you know, seasoning, and then you have really strong, potent stock. Though we won't throw away that, you know, the, the fish, and we're gonna fry it and introduce it back to the stew. Say, so, yeah, that's stock. Yeah, that's stock, and so that's how we're pretty much making a cocoa. So we have their cocoa-based stock, and like, you know, they've been, but no, no carrot there, no celery. This is how it's done, and that's what we're gonna use. <laughs> use for any other thing that we could really wanna do, uh, really, so that, so, 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 you know. Yeah, but I, I kind of understand that, for example, if I'm cooking for cassava, yeah. cassava leaf is like a national dish in yes. Sierra Leone. Yeah. Um, you talk about stock. I don't need to make my stock that way yeah. because Leeds doesn't use um, ogiri, for example, yeah, exactly, which is fermented yeah. sesame seed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's got humongous um, savory yeah. flavor into it. So if I use that in it, I've taken that flavor that they're fighting yeah. to find in all of the stuff, mm -hmm. I can find that in ogiri, mm -hmm, which yeah. is so important to us. Um, and um, balancing that, it's like understanding, you know, am I cooking traditional dish? Do I need to introduce all this um, Western stuff that I've learned into this? And if it's not necessary, I don't. But if I'm making Afrofusion and I feel like, okay, the stuff that I've picked up at culinary school, I need to introduce this mm. to get the best out of the African flavor, yeah. then I bring it yes. to it. So it's about balancing it and just thinking, okay, what am I cooking? And still, you know, trying to respect the ingredients. For me, it's very, very important when I'm cooking um, Sierra Leonean dish or Afrofusion dish to make sure that the African ingredients that I'm using in that, people clearly get it and they understand that the bolder flavor in that is the African dish mm. that I've used. And all the other stuff that I'm using with it is just to complement it. Mm. Yeah, and a massive example of that um, is the hibiscus and strawberry that I use. I use those two ingredients because I live in Kent. You know, Kent mm. is like strawberry paradise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I have hibiscus, which I grew up um, drinking. Um, we eat drinking, you know, sweet drinks, we make desserts with it, but we also use it in savory um, dishes um, as well and the different colors and all of that. So I knew which one I can mix with strawberry to get me a fantastic rich color, but also really, really good taste that complemented my Sierra Leonean heritage and also celebrates the, the strawberry mm. in Kent um, as well. So taking yeah. on board the context that you're in. Absolutely. Yeah. Which actually, in, in, in your book, when you talk about the history of Sierra Leone, you say there's a long history of mm. um, different like uh, people migrating and bringing their influences. Absolutely. And so there's, there's been a constant in interaction with new mm -hmm. flavors, new techniques coming yep. in, mm. in its entire history. So Absolutely. maybe it's like authentic to do that for yeah. you here, because yeah. you're interacting with where yeah. you are. Yeah, for Sierra Leonean food, exactly. Like we've constantly been interacting with different parts of um, West Africa. There's a huge um, West African influence, like Nigerian, Ghanaian. When I was growing, our neighbors um, upstairs were Ghanaians, and then next door were Togolese. Um, and there's that exchange of food as well. And each culture, each of these people bring in their core stuff. But each of the tribes as well cook differently. There's 16 tribes in Sierra Leone, and each of those tribes cook differently, and they all have things that they feel like they're really, really good at, mm. you know. 
like um, cre my mum is not Creo, but um, if I want to eat a really good Creo soup or Creo um, sauce, it's very good at cooking fufu, which is like a Saturday dish in Sierra Leone. So I, I know that if I eat that in my friend's house who is Creo, her mum is going to be super at cooking that. Mm. And if I want to ask questions about that dish, she's the person that will ask about it. If I want to eat like the leafy greens, I know who to speak to. I know the aunties and stuff, people to speak to because they're really good at that. And, um, and you talk about stock as well. We use lots of smoked fish yeah. um, to get flavor, to really get flavors out of things. And we use bone as well, yeah. like we use bones and stuff. So whether we're using just bone in the fish or bone in stuff to draw all the flavors yeah. out, of, out of that, not just like just getting a steak of it and just yeah. cooking it and forgetting about the rest of the stuff yeah. that really add that depth um, of flavor to, to your dish. And West African flavors, the Sierra Leonean flavors are like big, big bold yes. flavors. Mm -hmm. So a little stock where you're just adding yeah. carrots. I'm and talking that, about stock, you know, it's stock is actually, cut actually it at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to give you that massive flavor yeah. that you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. And you're talking about stock. Stock could also be, you know, beef, mm. fish, and yeah. all. Oh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. Lots of onions. If you say stew to someone yeah. in Sierra Leone, we're talking it's about meat, fish, everything, yeah. chicken <laughs> mixed together, and yeah. all of those flavors <laughs> adding stuff together. So it's not. We don't have problem mixing stuff, yeah. and um, and when it's mixed together, it always gives this unique flavor that you find. Yeah. And we have, you know. I always say to people, the flavor that you get from things like ogiri and palm oil, add it together. And red palm oil, oh, don't even get me started. Now, <laughs> because that annoys me so bad that mm. our oh. palm oil is given the same, um, you know, treated the same way as the palm oil that's destroying the rainforest, mm. which is mm. so different. Mm. The red palm oil that grows in West Africa, the red palm oil that grows in Sierra Leone, it's completely different from the red palm oil that grows outside of um, West Africa. Mm. And um, they want us to stop eating something that we've been eating for over 5,000 years because you've used it somewhere else and you're destroying the environment mm. with it and you want us to stop eating that. Yeah. It's like going to Italy and telling the Mediterraneans, don't eat olive oil. Mm. Like how insulting yeah. would that be? Yeah, you and, know? And, and lumping it and together. And lumping it together. Killing the nuance. And exactly, what? and killing the nuance because the, the flavor that you get from Oguri and Pamo mixed together, you cannot replicate that. Mm. No amount of flavoring stock and stuff will replicate that flavor. So you need to mix those flavors together. Mm. And it's very important for us to maintain that and to keep that because it's what makes us who we are. It's our identity. And you'll be asking me to lose my identity. Mm. Yeah. So beautiful. <laughs> you know, we, we spoke on the phone about, you know, uh, you cooking... Uh, so your cookbook being vegan Jamaican food, and but you really respecting that and uh, making a point that you don't call what you make as idol food, mm -mm. and you having a real respect for that being a separate thing. But I love when you when you said um, you're revisiting your childhood tongue in a modern day context. Yeah, I think that's like exactly what my food is about. Mm. And in terms of authenticity, what that means to me is being myself and telling my story. And I, in my food and everything I do, I just want to be myself. I'm, I'm kind of really tied to these memories of food. And I think it's important to continue to retell them in my own way. Mm. And I guess in my book, there's a lot of memories. And even just in the titles of dishes, like I have this dish called Tribute to Helsha, because, you know, I grew up going to Helsha, like, and eating like going to the beach and eating like fried fish. I don't eat fish anymore, but, and bami and like all these wonderful things. And so I wanted to honor that memory of doing that thing with my family and which is very vivid. And even just the smell like of those things. And it's important for me to retell it in a different way. And yeah, I think that's what makes also vegan food quite exciting. Cause I think there's still so many things like techniques and ways to achieve something. There isn't just like one route. Mm. And there's so many exciting ingredients. Like I use a lot of silk and tofu in the book because I think it's like a wonderful ingredient to use for baking. I think um, I've also developed an ice cream recipe because when I went to Japan, there were all these like soft serve um, kind of places and they made soft serve with like silk and tofu, which I thought was really interesting. So I came back home and started experimenting and like trying different ways to like make rum and raisin using silk and tofu. So I think it's like a different, just in terms of the food and how it's made, I think vegan food is 
quite exciting to create mm. in because there's so many ingredients. It's like a million like, you know, fruit, vegetables, like spices, like there's just, it feels like an endless kind of thing. And so that's kind of what I love about kind of cooking in this way. I think mm. it's really exciting. And what I'm hearing um, and uh, from what everyone's talking about and ha have written about as well. So I feel like f fusion before from the like European context has always been quite reductive. It's about stripping away and not yeah. respecting. But when when uh, you're, you guys are talking about fusion, you're talking about respecting, keeping, and then adding, and, and you know, like respecting the heritage of your food, of the abundance of it, and the uh, the and respecting the years of migration and like and the context that you're in too. Mm. Um, also, when I've I've read places where your foods have been referred to as elevated. I ha I've had an issue with that word. Yeah. Ag That's really it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, um, so like fine, so y you would refer to your food as yeah. fine dining, but what makes it fine dining to you? And you, 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 you also have used the words elevated, but it means different. You're reclaiming that word, right? Yeah. Fine dining and elevated. What does it mean to you? Because I, I find that again, it's the context with which other people write about it is yeah. to say you're doing it um, for a European palate that's yeah. maybe the presumption is it's better, there's more wisdom or it's more civilised or, mm, yeah. you know, and all these things. But what does it mean for you when you say fine dining and elevated? Fine dining to me means, you know, uh, you've carefully put together a menu okay. and that means you've thought through uh, your suppliers. Uh, the supply chain, you're using very good quality uh, produce, basically. And then you're thinking of, you know, um, how are you going to prepare it? How are you going to present it? And the service and atmosphere. And I think that's fine dining to me. It's not just a sort of put together bosh bash, you know. And then, but this one, we're just going to, you know, make sure it's done properly. Such as people come into the restaurant and have a wonderful experience. You know, the service is sleek. Uh, the food is good. Uh, you know the you know the uh, uh, the front of house. You know uh, you know a wonderful serving that food to you, and I think that's for me it's fine dining. We want you to come into a restaurant and then really have a beautiful uh, experience. Enjoy the space. Enjoy the food. Enjoy the service. As you look at the chefs who are preparing carefully, preparing that food for you. And you knowing that you know you've act, you know you're eating really good quality mm -hmm. ingredient you know um, and it's West African food, so elevate you know couple, you know because we said it's in city it's fine dining people then come and assume that oh it's fusion you know it's it's African food you know and I say to people that you know African food is wonderful you know it's beautiful I don't really try to decorate it just serve it in small plates mm -hmm. and beautiful, you know, I, I love my ceramics, you know, just a bit of it, just put, you know, something really small, you know, very delicious in this, you know, and, and that's it. And, you know, how you place it and how you do it, and I'm not a huge fan of, you know, drawing too much to it, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, that's what fine dining needs to be. Um, that's brilliant. Really. What about you, Maria? What would you say? Um, Care, care, time. Yeah. Um, I do put lots of effort and time into the dishes that I do Good. because I want when when I say to somebody you're eating yam or you're eating cassava, um, I want to get the best quality cassava. So it's the quality of the food as well. Um, if I say I'm going to cook fish for you. I'm gonna go to a fishmonger. I want to make sure that the fish that I'm getting for you doesn't affect Sierra Leone. Um, for wow. example, yeah. you know, there's a lot of overfishing and there's a lot of pillage and stealing of our fish mm. and stuff. So if I'm cooking fish for you, yeah. I want to put those care into it. I will speak to the fishmonger. How did you get this fish? How did you do this? And how did you? That's what fine dining means to me because it shouldn't. I shouldn't put it on your plate and let people in Sierra Leone suffer and not have enough fish and um, wow. back back at home. So it's about the care and um, the quality of the food. That's what fine dining um, means to me. Beautiful, yeah. Mm. I love that, I'm gonna clap to that. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've talked about, uh, you know, authenticity and taking care and respect um, 
with uh, the foods you're cooking. And that, I think, leads on to the wisdom of our regions, yeah. right? Uh, so I talked a little bit um, in the introduction about healthy foods, um, plant-based diets, eating locally, seasonably, rural practices. All these things have recently been um, appropriated, repackaged as um, a modern Western um, and, and a, uh, often a middle-class like kind of new era wisdom. But these practices have existed yeah, yeah, in so. our regions um, of, and cultures for centuries. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, what parts of those wisdoms you've embraced um, and uh, implemented in your kitchens. Um, um, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Um, I wanna give an example. Like I, I think one thing I, I have, I don't feel like is being implemented enough uh, in fine dining, for example, is eating with your hands, <laughs> right? Um, but I think, but I love it. And I love seeing the way um, different cultures like uh, use it and interact with it and the wisdom of eating with your hands, right? Um, so I grew up, one, uh, one of my best friends is Ethiopian. And uh, she, she would take us to this uh, restaurant called Weber Chevrolet in Elephant and Castle, and the first time she took me, I'll never forget, it was for her birthday, and um, when they brought uh, the injera out with all, it's like one big tray with all the dishes and um, on, on top of the injera, and we were a big group on the table, and she taught, so when, when she started the feast, like to get everyone started, she made it a point that she was the first one to tear a bit of the bread a bit of the food and she fed me with it first and then everyone started feeding someone else and it was it tr she said it, it is our tradition to feed the people you love before you start eating your health oh, wow. your, oh, yourselves wow. yeah. and she and then she, she fed me with her hands and we were eating with our hands and I just thought it was the most beautiful thing and I felt like family in that moment and yeah. we, we have been family since and there's a, for me, there's a cleanliness to eating with your hands yeah. that you don't get with cutlery because you're consciously keeping your hands clean constantly. Mm -hmm. What would you guys say about that? Like eating with your hands, um, if you want to talk about, but also other wisdoms that you make a point to really hold on to. I think the seasonality thing is something mm -hmm. that, like you're saying, how that concept is almost like... Um, people think it's like a middle-class thing, right? But it's ingrained in me as a Jamaican. Yeah. Like, I'm so, I grew up being so aware of everything that's around me. And you'd go to like a relative's house and they might have a star fruit tree and they'll just like gift you this thing that mm. nature is giving you at the perfect time, right? And there's something when you're like yearning for a mango, but you wait, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. you, you yeah. wait for it, right? <laughs> Mm. And so that's always been ingrained yes. in me. So I guess I didn't even know I was eating seasonally because yes. it was just what mm. I did and, and how I was brought up to be appreciative of the things around me. Um, and so that's something that I try and think about here and like what is growing around me and how I can utilize those ingredients, but impart the kind of flavors from Jamaica while still honoring the seasonality of like being here mm. and those ingredients that are quite wonderful too mm. and so I guess that's kind of that. something that I try and like implement in my food. What would you say Maria? Um, yeah um, <laughs> we talk about um, you know man waiting for mango it's raining season at the moment in Sierra Leone so it's mango season mm. so we have food season <laughs> so it's mango season so you eat mango till your heart's content and then once it's gone it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. you wait <laughs> until and then another, you wait, yeah. exactly you wait until there's another mango season yeah. and you wait carefully for it because your neighbors are all going to be like having so much mango and begging yeah. you to eat it and of course when it's mango season you're eating it on its own you're cooking it in a, like a stew pottage um, you you eat in all shapes and manner because it's mango season. Mm. Um, so I do try my best to to do that here when it's um, season to work with mm. seasonal stuff and um, and try and um, not necessarily spices but also try and blend what I can get in you know um, in Peckham or in the African. Um, stuff and uh, I've got a local veg lady who is fantastic so for instance when somebody ha 
um, contact me for an event. I speak to Becky because if I'm not too familiar, sometimes it's what's in season or what's not. I'm like, I've got an event, it's for this amount of people, what's in season, mm. let's talk. And then we'll talk about what's in season and then what she's got. Um, and then I work out what flavors and what African flavors I can mix with those things mm. and do a menu, which is why I don't necessarily usually have a, a set menu mm. because I work with what's there and then add impact Sierra Leone into it because um, it's always the bolder better flavor <laughs> anyway so yeah um and and that um but in terms of ceremonies and that i i love community cooking and community eating commensality commensality i just think it's amazing and it just brings everyone together and at my studio i try that i love it when families like come together and hire me and we sit in there and they're eating and we're talking about it i'm telling them about the food and it's the experience you know the experience for me is so important because um just um listening to them talk about the food or interacting with me and mm -hmm. we're discussing the food and how that connects mm -hmm. to me and how that relates to sierra leone um and that i love it it's like the best for me. So those are the little ceremonies oh, I that, love that. I, I, I do keep. And I've introduced collar knots um, as well and welcoming people with collar knots as well because in Sierra Leone, when you go to somebody, they welcome you with collar, which is why when you open my book, there's um, collar yes. knots. Yeah, mm, because it's a welcoming thing. They send to you a welcome and they break it. Because when you eat collar, there's a little bitter bitterness to it mm. and then the sweetness comes um, um, and that. So... I've introduced having like colour nut biscuits um, to people because I, love um, that. I feel like it's very important to continue that. I don't necessarily have the fresh colour nuts to give them, but they'll eat it in a biscuit. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Aji? And we are at Akukwe to what's in season in the UK. It's a West African restaurant in the UK. So what's it in season in the UK that we also have in Africa? So for if it's lamb, if it's beef, if it's guinea hen. And so it's, you know, what's in season in the UK? and then prepare a wonderful world which is still a West African dish, really. Uh, oh, yes, please. Uh, such as we then make sure that West African food is not only, you know, imported, you know, uh, produce from Africa. You could create West African food entirely from produce in the UK. So it's the flavors, it's the techniques, you know, pretty much how we do things that you're trying to get. Mm. And so that's, that's for us. And, and you know, Coco, before you eat at home, you you know you pretty much wash your hands, mm -hmm. and so we've been really thinking of trying to uh, do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we thought of mm -hmm. you know having a bowl where people wash their hands, but mm -hmm. that's yes. going to be too much of we me. But you know, well. pretty much wet towels, wash your hands, mm -hmm. and pretty much okay. the first snack you pretty much eat with your hand. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's what you need know, for your hand for you then. You know. Uh, and I think whilst eating with, with your hands is amazing, it's good, you know, you know, family coming together, washing their hands thoroughly, cleanly, mm. and eating with their hands is wonderful. But I think, you know, uh, even back home to when you then go to parties, you know, yeah, your yeah, glamour exactly. is dressed, yeah. you know, women have the false nails and all that, like, <laughs> really deep, your hand in stew, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's the nails. It's the nails. Oh, it's it's the nails. nails. <laughs> and so when you get to, you know, the heavy eating, yeah, then yeah. you have to eat it up room. to eat yeah. yes. Exactly. Because yeah. the era has changed now. Yeah. Nails. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. One of the Thank wisdoms you. I love um, is that we don't write recipes down. Oh. Um, yeah. And I uh, there's no like culture of written recipes. Oh. Um, uh, and uh, what that does is encourage you to hold on tighter. Yeah. I think that's what yeah. what it stands it for our community, and it means what. Um, Often when you ask, like when you ask uh, older generations for recipes, they get really annoyed. Yes, um, <laughs> absolutely. Well, just look at what I'm doing. Yeah. Just look at what I'm doing. And that comes from you earn yeah. the right to cook this right. You have to watch me. You have mm. to spend time with me. You have to try it. You have to interact with yeah, the other generations. Right. We have yeah. to be together yeah. for you oh, to learn. You, you know, I'm not going to text you the recipe. Yeah. You, you yeah. <laughs> and I think there's wisdom yeah. in that. So before, like, I used to think, oh, our people don't write down recipes. It's like, <laughs> no, actually, there's so much wisdom in that. And I just think there's, you know, that we don't realize there's these things that are actually, like, so much wisdom behind mm. it. Mm. And with that, it leads to my final question before I um, put some questions out to the audience, or the audience to us, I mean, it is um, talking about, like, the unfamiliar. I think we're so used to things being framed as our stuff being looked at as unfamiliar, right? Like, mm. where, uh, you know, 
our ingredients are hard to source or mm. Um, mm. treated as the other or alien. Mm. Um, <laughs> none of us were born here on the panel, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And so I'd I just wanted to end with like a really fun question of uh, your memories of coming here and what were in ingredients that very quintessentially British or English that were unfamiliar to you, um, like and were shocking to you when you first tried it, or like your memories of it. Like, so I'll start. I'll give an example. Um, when I first came here, like I was four, so around like age of five, my my parents I remember took took me to a workman's cafe because someone like um, Kurdish ran it, and. Um, we went there and they were talking as adults and all I could see on this table was this bright yellow jar that said like English mustard mm -hmm. and I was like what is that and it's like really bright <laughs> <laughs> and I just because you know for me coming from like Turkey to here it was like going from Technicolor to like grey like everything was sad, like it felt sad just because of the context of coming here. So no, obviously I love this city now and I, like this is, this is, this is, you know, like, uh, but it felt like my memory is like that it was grey, everything was grey. So here was this bright yellow thing on the table and I was like, and I couldn't, I could, I didn't care what they were talking about and I was just looking at it like, how am I going to try it? How am I going to try it? No one's telling me what you do with it. And I just, I just grabbed it like when no one was looking, I opened it. And it was the most abusive <laughs> thing. Like my face, like it was just like, I just remember that whole like time being a slap in the face. Like everything was a slap in the face and that was a slap in the face. Now I love mustard, but yeah, that's like a memory that I have. Like what, what, you, what memories do you guys have of any ingredients that are surprising mm. to you that are different? Like sliced bread, for example, who knew? Mm. <laughs> 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 I guess I've got like quite a few. Okay, there's, there's, please. I guess everything, I guess, was different. Yeah. <laughs> I moved. Exactly. I moved here when I was nine, and so everything was different. But I remember there's a specific memory of me, like, you know, I grew up watching a lot of American TV, mm. and I don't remember what cartoon it was, but there was always this emphasis on this like red, shiny apple. And I was so obsessed with trying this apple because I've never had an apple like this before. I've only seen it on TV. Mm. And I remembered coming here and being like, okay, I really want to try it, like this apple that I've seen on TV. And I was so disappointed <laughs> 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 with the apple. Because I was yeah. like, oh, like, it's, it was just... <laughs> also, the apples in Jamaica are like so much better. Yeah. So much more, like I yearn for them now, but it's interesting that like, you know, through watching something and like this uh, this thing that was like in the distance and like you look at these countries and like I grew up watching American TV and I was so fascinated and I was just so disappointed. Yeah. That's a good apple. apple. <laughs> Any other? For me, it was actually bread, baguette, because, you know, growing <laughs> up, you know, all the bread in Nigeria is pretty much the, I could give bread, the really <laughs> soft bread, you know, so not slice it, pull it and, you know, toss it in a stew and eat it. And so I got out from the, you know, airport and then I saw this really long red baguette. I said, oh, that would be, oh, that's really nice. Oh, that's a nice concept. We didn't even grab the nice ghetto. Concept. And it was quite, I actually couldn't eat it. I said, I could, it I just couldn't, you know, work out how, you know, bread could be that hard. So I actually thought I was so <laughs> I actually thought I was something wrong, but I, I did not eat it. So. <laughs> oh, well, I, I suppose um, no, that, that wasn't it for me. Um, we're, we're near the French Africa, Guinea, so they eat bread yeah, like bread, that. Yeah. So we have bread that's a little bit like, like the baguettes um, yeah. as well. I think everything was, everything was unfamiliar. So I, I, for me, I, I grew up in a family where food and cooking together, eating together was a massive thing mm. to us. Um, all of a sudden, I find myself in what I call, I used to call deepest, darkest Kent, where I was um, <laughs> the only black person in the village, basically. So everything was was new. Everything was um, was um, strange. You talk about apple. We do have apples, um, and the apples that we know. I think Melissa and I saw, saw it. Um, some Elisa and I actually saw it. Um, these rose apples, we call them. So that's what we have in Sierra Leone. So when I 
apples here. Everything was completely Different. new. But I was disappointed um, as well. <laughs> but the thing, the biggest disappointment was things that I was familiar with as well, that there's um, avocado, mm. there's um, pineapple, there's mangoes and that. The disappointment in tasting those, like mm. it puts you off them forever yeah. because you just yeah. like, yeah. wow, I yeah. did not yeah. know it could be this bad. <laughs> 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 you know, it's just, it, it, I've never got over that. So for me, it's just the things that I was familiar with just saying it. Banana, you know, banana, I, I never oh knew banana could yeah. be yellow because the banana in Sierra Leone is it's green, you know, but it's so tasty. Mm. And the size of everything as well, you know, the bananas in Sierra Leone, they're tiny little little yes. things and they're super sweet um, mm. as well and all of a sudden you get these giant yellow things that don't taste anything, anything. it's just like I talk about this very disappointing. Um, cucumbers people I, I do yeah. a whole yeah. series yeah. on my Instagram about cucumbers people went crazy for it <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I talk about no, but like in the Middle East, there's no such thing as one massive cucumber. <laughs> we, we have such a variety and they're all yeah. like small, yeah. different range, and you use the different ones you use for different things and there's so much flavour in it. And it's so unnatural, the idea of like one massive one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, um, oh, this has been wonderful. Um, I want to open it up uh, to questions from the audience. Does anyone have uh, any questions? I can't see. Um, back there? Is there a mic? You're saying, do you have a positive experience? Yes, good question. Positive experience. Yeah, um, you know, I was exposed to a lot of new um, stuff. I'm very mm. curious about food, about ingredients. So I was exposed to a lot of new food, a lot of new ingredients, and a lot of new methods of cooking, and um, making new friends um, as well. And um, yeah, um, you know, I've built a family here, so that's positive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but lots of, um, the, the food side, definitely I was disappointed. I'm not going to lie about that. But everything else I think has been quite positive. Yeah, I think for me, it's like um, just exposure to different things. Yeah. I'd never mm. Like I'd never tried a strawberry before, mm. like a fresh like one. So... Just stuff like that, I think. I love strawberries. It's strawberry season. I'm yes. love mm, yeah. obsessed with yeah. like that kind of thing. And um, I moved to Margate like uh, 2019, January 2019, and elderflower and like mm. strawberry for me. So mm. there's elderflower in the park mm. that was closest to me, so I'd always go. So stuff like that I'm like in love with, just yeah. observing what is around me. Mm. And it's been a really wonderful journey to like discover the things that I love the most about here. Yeah. Yeah, there are lots of positives. You know, uh, when I went to Lita, I really, you know, enjoyed my, my time there uh, very well. The entire book, you know, pretty much a Bible of, you know, you know the cuisine that you'd ever learn, mm. putting together in a place I thought I was magical. And all of those recipes, you know, I can still cook, I, you know. And, you know and, and I think what's positive, you know, for me is actually, you know, everything documented and understood and known. And mm. then, you know... Um, yeah showcase to the world that this is beautiful, this is amazing. I think what I took from there is now do that with your own and then share it with the world as well. Mm. You know, so lots of positive for me, really. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone? Um, here and then back there. Brilliant. Mine is a quick one. Um, I ask every chef, what are your signature dishes? Sorry, what? what are your signature dishes? Oh, my signature dish. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, signature dish for traditional, I, I've got two because I've got two sides to me. Um, <laughs> traditional, I would say cassava leaf. Um, that's my signature dish. And um, the Afrofusion one, I'm going to say an ingredient because I use that a lot, um, hibiscus. Mm, yeah, beautiful. I use this sweet, savory um, dish, and I love using it because it's got brilliant color, and um, it's so versatile as well. Mm. This is a tricky question because yeah. I, I feel like I'm always creating things, but I guess my latest obsession and thing that I'm obsessed with is like the concept of like creating dessert patties, and so I grew up eating patties just like. So many Jama Jamaicans grew up eating patties. But I have this very specific memory of like eating a patty with like chocolate milk 
Mm. And Ooh. so for a long time, it's been on my brain, like, to make a dessert patty. So um, recently, for, like, two separate group of people, I've, like, made two different versions of, like, dessert kind of patties. Um, so I guess that's something that I'm, like, kind of creating now and just being a bit obsessive about Amazing. different combinations. Our signature dish at a cup is jump rice. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's always been on demand since we opened and still there now. Wow. Yeah. So. Love it. Yeah. Uh, there was a question back there. Um, you, you talked about trying to, um, being disappointed with local mangoes and pineapples, et cetera, but also about finding um, your ingredients in very local um, markets or food, food shops. And I think, I just wanted to know how much you would encourage us, rather than spending our money in the supermarkets for very expensive and often tasteless ingredients, to encourage us to go to those smaller local markets that sell so much of our, the ingredients from our homes um, and supporting them as local businesses in particular, but also getting those authentic ingredients because you can find so much yeah. there. But, Absolutely. you know, too often we're not, we shop in the supermarkets instead. It was, it was an eye-opener because I, I lived in Kent for three, four years before I discovered Peckham in Brixton. <laughs> I didn't know that there was a place like that that existed. The first time I went to Peckham, I think I, I cried a little bit. Because I just felt like, oh my God, there's Peckham. This is amazing. Um, and it, it's true. And, I'm, you know, I'm, it's really, really important um, for, for us to go to these places and go to our local mm -hmm. shops, like the local Asian, local Afro-Caribbean shops. They've got so much and they're usually so welcoming and so exciting. And um, I keep encouraging people because um, I keep reading reviews. I'm obsessed with reading reviews about books that are not um, English or European cookbooks. And um, quite a lot of the time people complain about, I can't get hold of the ingredients. I'm sorry, you're not gonna find it in the supermarket. So find your local Afro-Caribbean shops. I'm obsessed with Japanese food. You know, my daughter loves, loves it. And we find it. When we want to eat authentic Japanese food, we find those ingredients. We go out and we, we find it. So it can be done for African food as well. You have to go out and you have to interact with these shops. Mm. And you ha they're, they're so happy and they're so welcoming when you go in there and they want to tell you about all the ingredients and where it's coming from. And it's a chance also to know a little bit about your neighbor. Um, to know a little bit about the person that you work with um, that cook completely different pro probably from yourselves as well. So absolutely, the mangoes in Peckham are so much better. The pineapple, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the avocados, they're like massive, just like you get in Sierra Leone. Um, so yes, absolutely. Go to Brixton, go to Peckham, go to all these places, these big market areas and just um, speak to the stallholders. Um, you'll be amazed, um, you know, what it can even pull out the back for you. Sometimes they even get like sugar cane for me, whole ones. Yeah, so it's amazing. Wonderful. Uh, how, how are we doing for time? Uh, yeah, we've got time for one more question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I had a question about whose responsibility do you think it is to learn about the cuisine? Is it something for you to teach others or to make them interested, or is it also someone else's responsibility to show interest? For example, I'm from Yemen. Um, I've lived with different people because I'm in London. Um, oftentimes, I would say to my flatmates, you know, this is what we eat. Like, would you be interested in like doing something together? And then you can try my cuisine. And then they'll say, yeah, 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 we should do that sometime. But then they show zero interest. And that has happened like throughout. So I've come to, um, um, to a point where I'm like, you know what? If you don't show interest, I'm not even going to bother. So what are your thoughts on this? I th think it's your responsibility to, you know, uh, sh you know show it to the world. You know, you know, let people know that it's wonderful, it's exciting. Let them come get it. You know, pretty much. And I think everything about you know the you know the you know the French cuisine is because it, they believe in it. You know, which you know they love it so much and think this is the best thing. And then we're going <laughs> to let everybody know about it. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely wonderful. And I think it's called packaging. Uh, you know, it's you know it's <laughs> you know, and everybody just wants to you know. 
it's, you know, French, you know, you just want to, you know, uh, I, I think it's just about being comfortable, confident in your own, and then let them um, get excited about it, you know, tell the world about it, and then they will be excited, you know, ignite them with your own excitement, and then they will love it because you love it. Um, I think it's both sides. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Personally, I feel like it's my responsibility to teach you about Sierra Leonean food. But, um, and I also feel like um, it's a responsibility of the, the press, people who sign books, to also encourage me to be able to be myself yeah. and to be able yeah. to tell you my story. So you learn about my cuisine, you learn that, you know, not every, because there's this also a lot of misconceptions and really bad press. And people say, oh, but I don't eat spicy food. And I'm like, I don't either. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know where you got that idea from that my food <laughs> is all about spice. Yeah. There's so much more to it. Yeah. So, you know, it's good press. Um, it's my responsibility to teach you, but it's also the other person's responsibility to learn about it. And it's the press, so there's a lot of people responsible here. But yeah, more publishers signing more books, more people reading and more opportunities to people like myself, you know, to people like us to tell our story and to tell our authentic story and not say to us, well, I want you to write an African cookbook. I cannot write an African yeah. cookbook. I can only write about Sierra Leone. Um, you know, I can tell you a little bit about West Africa and West African ingredients, but I can't tell you an African story because um, that's not my story. It's an entire continent. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, I completely agree with you. And I guess when I was writing my book, I, there was like a conscious thing of yeah. like telling my story yeah. and representing Jamaica in the best way that I could that also represented me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really lovely that, you know, to see more of our books on the Absolutely. shelves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Um, there was a question over here, this lady, yeah? Is there a mic? The mic's gone. Mic's gone. We can hear you. Yeah. We well, can. I'm sure yes, you can. can. <laughs> 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 I, I, this is really for Denny, because I grew up in Jamaica, and I Stop don't it. remember seeing vegan food in Jamaica, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, I think it's going on really well. It's really interesting because I feel like, um, I felt like there was a space missing in the yeah. Jamaican scene here. When, But in Jamaica, there's loads of vegan food. There's like, yeah. I, t no, I feel like idol food is like quite a big part of Jamaica. And whenever I'm there, you're kind of spoilt for choice of those kind of restaurants. But I grew up eating such a quintessential Jamaican diet that I felt like when I moved here, when I had the concept of these table and when I started making vegan Jamaican food, I was kind of recreating the dishes that I had grow grown up, just like, you know, a patty or like brown stew, like chicken or like whatever, these things that I had that I was like, oh man, I can't get this. So now I feel like I have the mm. responsibility to recreate it in my own way so that other people can have it. And I remembered when I did my first event, loads of people came and they're like, thank you so much for doing this. Cause I haven't had, you know, they haven't had like a vegan rum and raisin or like any of these things. I haven't had that before. So I think that it's really lovely when you do something and you're seen by the kind of community. <laughs> I think, um, did you want to answer that? <laughs> I, think, um, I think that's what's so amazing about Jamaica in general. I think you're, you're literally, you're spoilt for choice when you're, when you're there and there's so many amazing dishes that are inherently um, vegan anyways. And I grew up, I didn't grow up eating meat every single day. I think that's quite a Western thing in general to me anyways. Mm. Like I grew up many days like not eating meat and just really appreciating like a good kalaloo of lots of garlic and like, you know, all these wonderful things that are just, you know, inherently vegan. So I think Jamaica is a wonderful island to, to travel to and to eat vegan food. To grow up in. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you so much for that. Honestly, my neck is hurting from kind of nodding so furiously. I can hear like, the murmurings coming from the audience, so you just know when it's like a really enriching, amazing conversation. Um, to, to Melek, to Maria, to Dano, to Aji, thank you so much. Um, uh, Dano's going to be um, signing copies of her book, Plentiful, down in the, um, in the, in the main foyer in the pavilion, uh, which is also where the next event is taking place conveniently. Maria's book is available to pre-order. We couldn't get any because it's, it's still kind of a few weeks off. Um, do pre-order because it's really important for authors and go and eat at a cocoa um, because it is the most incredible food. It's so beautiful. Melek hasn't written a book yet to the annoyance of many people <laughs> but when she finally does, buy it. Thank you so much and thank you, you're amazing. Thank you.